This is a memo that describes how we're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. I said, is it classified? He said, yes, sir. I said, <laughs> I said well, don't show it to me. this brilliant idea that we were going to come to Pakistan and create a force of Mujahideen, equip them with Stinger missiles and everything else to go after the Soviets inside Afghanistan. We also have a history of kind of moving in and out of Pakistan. I mean, let's remember here, the people we are fighting today, we funded 20 years ago. And we did it because we were locked in this struggle with the Soviet Union. They invaded Afghanistan. And we did not want to see them control Central Asia. And we went to work. And it was President Reagan, in partnership with the Congress, um, led by Democrats, who said, you know what? Sounds like a pretty good idea. Let's deal with the ISI and the Pakistani military. And let's go recruit these Mujahideen. And let's great. Let's get some to come from Saudi Arabia and other places, importing their Wahhabi brand of Islam so that we can go beat the Soviet Union. And we, guess what? They retreated. They lost billions of dollars, and it led to the collapse of the Soviet Union. So there's a, a very strong argument, which is it wasn't a bad investment to end the Soviet Union, but let's be careful what we sow because we will harvest. So we then left Pakistan. We said, okay, fine. You deal with the stingers that we've left all over your country. You deal with the mines that are along the border. And by the way, we don't want to have anything to do with you. In fact, we're sanctioning you. So we stopped dealing with the Pakistani military and with ISI, and we now are making up for a lot of lost time. So this is an incredibly difficult set of issues that are all interconnected. But, you know, we can point fingers at the Pakistanis, which is, you know, I did some yesterday, frankly. And it's merited because we're wondering why they don't just get out there and deal with these people. But the problems we face now, to some extent, we have to take responsibility for having contributed to. We know of their deep belief in God, and we are confident that their struggle will succeed. Because your fight will prevail, and you'll have your homes and your mosques back again. Because your cause is right, and God is on your side. For all these decades since, we have been using Wahhabism uh, in its radicalized form in order to pursue Western interests uh, against the Ba'athists, against the Nasserists, um, against the Soviet Union, influence in the Middle East, and against Iran and Syria uh, uh, since. So we've had this deep ambivalence in Western policy where we're both in bed with terrorists and fighting them at the same time in many cases. We don't say that very often so publicly. Part of the war your, your view was that a war in Iraq would aggravate the threat from whatever source yeah. to the United Kingdom. How did you communicate this view to the Prime Minister? I, it was communicated through the Duke assessments. There undeniably would be no ISIS if we had not invaded Iraq. ISIL is a direct outgrowth of al-Qaeda in Iraq that grew out of our invasion, which is an example of unintended consequence. Well, let, me, let me quote you, your former colleague, Major yeah. General Douglas Stone, who ran the U.S. Right, detention Stone, system right. in Iraq. He yeah. said he called the U.S. prison system a jihadi university that was breeding more terrorists. Yeah, I, I believe that, and he ran them. Then when we turned those detention facilities over to Iraq, that became far worse because there was no standards in those prisons at all. You at least were, we had well, let's standards. Talk about, let's talk about standards. Uh, and you mentioned Camp Bucker and Camp Cropper. 
and you mentioned standards. You didn't mention Camp Nama in Iraq, yeah. uh, which was nicknamed Nasty Ass Military Area, and where, according to a New York Times investigation, US interrogators beat prisoners with rifle butts, spat in their faces, and used them for target practice in a game of paintball, where the motto was no blood, no foul, meaning interrogators couldn't be prosecuted if they visibly, if a detainee didn't visibly bleed. Are you telling me, A, those are standards you're proud of, and B, that didn't help? in no. the rise of ISIL? No, I mean, obviously, no. Because you yourself have referred to the people your men were fighting in Iraq as barbarians who crawled out of the sewer. You say in your memoir, these were the chanting barbarians American troops had been sent to liberate? Sure. If you, if, if people that think it's okay to drive a car bomb into the middle of a square, into the middle of a marketplace, while to attempt to kill an American, and in, 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 in doing so, they kill dozens and dozens of civilians, absolutely, that's barbaric. Which is true. I think if you refer to terrorists, you call them whatever you want. But you said these were the chanting barbarians American troops had been sent to liberate. You weren't sent to liberate terrorists. It sounds like you're talking about Iraqis. Sir, uh, look, the, the, it's the, from the, your the, words the, from your memory. The, the, decision, the decision of Iraq. Please. Was the question that in my 30 years' experience of uh, of working with these groups, actually on both ways, on both sides, um, of radical groups and having been involved with them. Nearly always standing behind radical groups has been a state actor or an intelligence service or, or, of a state actor. They are not just entirely something that has spontaneously arisen. Isn't the Second. problem the Afghan government, they don't like your plan. They say it's a non-starter. They say under no circumstances Will we allow the war to become a, quote, private for profit business? The former Afghan president, Hamid Kaze, said he vehemently opposes your proposal. It's a non starter. I think he would say differently if you asked him now. I literally it, it, asked his office on Friday and they said they're dead against it. <laughs> well, I've talked, to other people in his, I, I've talked to other people in his office who would disagree with that. Okay. okay. And the current Here's Afghan the government, Here's have the they thing. changed their position as well? They uh, said in October, uh, under no circumstances. I, I doubt very much that Ashraf Ghani will, will win in the next election. So you're waiting for a change of president to get your plan signed off. In 2006, according to leaked Pentagon documents, Blackwater guards fired indiscriminately at Iraqi civilians, killing, among others, an ambulance driver. In 2007, Blackwater guards shot and killed 14 Iraqi civilians in what's been called the Nisor Square Massacre, or Baghdad's Bloody Sunday. That is the record that a lot of people around the world remember when they hear the name Blackwater. Sure, and when you do 100,000 missions, it's easy to take some things out of context, but remember, uh, you had many thousands of insurgents actively trying to kill Americans, and not just American servicemen, but the most uh, newsworthy Americans there, diplomats. And when the State Department asked you but to But the people drive I'm them, mentioning weren't insurgents. You killed, at uh, Nissau Square, your men killed a mother and son on their way to an appointment, a doctor sadly, and a son. They killed a nine-year-old boy, shot sadly, him in the head. Whenever you speak to American officials or former officials, they mm -hmm. talk about Iranian bad behavior, undeniable yeah, as it is. Yeah, it's undeniable, that's right. But when you talk to Iranians or Iranian officials, they'll say, what about American bad behavior? We never sure. hear about America's support for the Shah for the toppling of Mohammad Mossadegh, the Iranian prime minister, sure. for the support of Saddam's invasion of Iran, the shooting down of Iranian airliner. There's enough bad behavior to go around on all sides, isn't there? But it's the not, you know, you know, so I'm not gonna disagree with you on those, on those issues. We can't, those are but facts. Camp Bukha. That's the name of the post-war US detention facility in southern Iraq, in which around 100,000 Iraqi men were held. Again, many of them were completely innocent. Well, camp Bukha and other military facilities ended up being luxury radicalization centers. It then became a management seminar for upper echelons of ISIS. One former Bukha detainee was none other than Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. You might have heard of him. He's the founder of ISIS. According to Iraqi terrorism expert Hisham al-Hashimi, the loathsome Baghdadi got more radicalized while in US detention, where he, quote, absorbed the jihadist ideology and established himself. Thanks, Kambuka. How long would you stay Look, in Iraq for? Forever? I would stay as long as American interests are served by being in Iraq. I don't know how long that would be. But that's not the question. The question what about Iraqi now, interests? That's not the question. I'm, I am a servant of the American government. So my perspective is going to be what is in America's interests. You asked a question about how long America would stay. <laughs> I asked a question about another country, and you said American interests. I'm wondering about yeah. Iraqi interests. If well, they don't want American troops well, there, of course. who cares about American interests, well, right? Well, of course. You believe in democracy? I, I knew why, because I'd been through the Pentagon. Right after 9-11, about 10 days after 9-11, I went through the Pentagon, and I saw Secretary Rumsfeld, and 
and Deputy Secretary Wolfowitz, I went downstairs just to say hello to some of the people on the joint staff who had used, used to work for me. And one of the generals called me in. He said, sir, you got to come in. you got to come in and talk to me a second. I said, well, you're too busy. He said, no, no. He says, we've made the decision we're going to war with Iraq. This was on or about the 20th of September. I said, we're going to war with Iraq. Why? He said, I don't know. <laughs> he said, I guess they don't know what else to do. So uh, I said, well, did they find some information collect connecting Saddam to al-Qaeda? He said, no, no. He says, there's nothing new that way. They just made the decision to go to war with Iraq. He said, I guess it's like we don't know what to do about terrorists, but we've got a good military and we can take down governments. And um, he said, I guess if, if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem has to look like a nail. So I came back to see him a few weeks later. And by that time, we were bombing in Afghanistan. I said, are we still going to war with Iraq? And he said, oh, it's worse than that. He said, he reached over on his desk. He picked up a piece of paper. And he said, I just, he said, I just got this down from upstairs, meaning the Secretary of Defense office today. And he said, this is a memo that describes how we're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. I said, is it classified? He said, yes, sir. I said, <laughs> I said, well, don't show it to me. And I saw him a year or so ago, and I said, you remember that? He said, sir, I didn't show you that memo. I didn't show it to you. But I think, by and large, uh, there is nothing to apologize for. Nothing to apologize for. So when the U.S. invaded Iraq in 2003 in defiance of international law, no WMDs found, no al-Qaeda connections, terror threat to the U.S. increased, thousands of people tortured, hundreds of thousands killed, millions displaced from their homes, Iran's influence increased in the region, ISIL born in Iraq, several trillion dollars burned through in the process. You don't think that requires any kind of, you know what, we got some things wrong? Well, we certainly did get some things wrong, but that's what happens.